I'm Jim Latin. I'm a professor of marketing here at the GSB. Uh, this is, what, 34 years for me at the GSB. And if you had asked me when I arrived if I thought I would ever be teaching a subject like Salesforce management, I would have told you you were high. <laughs> but it's been 15 years now, and that's what I've been doing. Uh, let me introduce my, uh, my kind of co-panelist in all of this. Mike, you want to say a few words? Yeah, so Mike Smirklow, um, I uh, ran a, started a search fund in 2001, uh, bought a company called Service Source, and ran it for about almost 12 years. Um, and now live in Austin, Texas, where I have a small venture capital firm investing in early stage technology related companies. Great, great. So, um, as you know, this is one of three breakout sessions that are taking place, all of which are focusing on issues that relate to either sales, building sales, sales leadership, or something like that. And I need to just take a minute to reflect on the fact that 15 years ago here at the GSB, you could not find a course on sales or sales management anywhere in the MBA curriculum. We did nothing like that, and yet we have a conference now in which, uh, you know, an important slot in time of the day has really been devoted to this. And frankly, I think it was search fund folks and entrepreneurs and so on who goaded us into doing something like this, the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies. Students there kept getting this feedback. Pay attention in class when they talk about sales because that's one of the most important things you're going to do. And so they go back and they look at the curriculum and say, unless I'm missing something, there is no place to pay attention in class about sales or sales force management. So Mark Leslie and I started this about 15 years ago, and uh, I'm just really pleased at the group that we have built up. Mike, for example, cooperated with us, helped us to write a case. We've done a lot of things with the CES, case writers uh, like Sarah. Sarah. So um, we have sort of an opportunity to reflect on some of that experience. What Mike and I would like to do together is something that's sort of the flip or the inverse of what of the session that you just went through with the CEO panel. Uh, rather than spend most of the time with us talking and a small amount of time on Q&A, we want to flip that. Mike and I thought that we would have a bit of a conversation for about 15 or 20 minutes and then spend the rest of the time having the session essentially driven by Q&A. So this is my signal to all of you that it's going to be your responsibility to help us carry the rest of the session. Right? And I hope that we'll be able to set up some things that'll give you a sense of the boundaries and the things that we'll be discussing. But we're going to start with a nice, you know, sitting down and chatting with one another. Um, you know, Mike and I started by talking about this, and uh, I was taken, as I asked him about his experience in, in a kind of building and scaling a sales organization, I asked him about his experience, and the word that he used that I grabbed on was battle scars. And I thought, battle scars, that's a really interesting place to start. And I just thought, you know, it would be interesting for others to kind of hear your story. You know, what were some of those battle scars? And then maybe we can reflect on some of the learning from, you know, that kind of came from them. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I would really encourage start everyone to ask questions because I've got a couple of former board members here. And uh, one company that I sit on the board of, and, and anyone who knows me knows that I can talk for about an hour without stopping, so I would encourage the questions. But um, can I tell a story? I think you should. Okay, I will. Um, and by the way, I'm also good at interrupting people who go great. on for hours. So. Well, some of my stories are entertaining, right, Bill? <laughs> Every once in a while, Bill Egan can attest, I tell a good story. Um, so I bought this company with a great, uh, a wonderful friend of mine, David Kennedy, who now runs Serent Capital uh, here in San Francisco. We bought in 2003, there was one salesperson, it was one of the founders. Um, and we, Dave and I had split up, like most search funders, our roles and responsibilities, and I took on sales and marketing. And so I spent a year following one of the founders around. Business was doing about five million in revenue, and learned everything I could from him. And he was migrating out of the business, and so we did, we made, I think, the mistake that I see over and over again. Um, we thought, we need to go hire a head of sales. That's what we do. Almost like. You know, my, my toilet's leaking, I need to hire a plumber. Let me go look in the white pages and find, or yellow pages and find a plumber. That's kind of the mindset we had. So we thought we got to go hire a great head of sales. And so my real battle scar, the first one was, um, it was July of 2004, so a year and a half into the search. The business was going okay. I literally hadn't taken a day off, and neither had David. We had just hired our head of sales. And we went out and found a guy who had run a big 
sales team and had all the right boxes that you check. Yes, great salesperson. I even went to his former CEO's house for lunch to do the, the reference checks that we talked about in that last session mm -hmm. or heard about. So I thought I had done all the right things. And he had been at one point a really good salesperson. He'd made a lot of money. Um, and then he, as we found out later, the punchline is he had developed some interesting personal habits that we weren't aware of. So call it the first month on the job, he tended not to show up on Mondays. Mondays were a particularly hard day for him. Um, drank a lot of coffee. Um, he also had a bunch, he'd come in and he had uh, uh, band-aids on his thumb where it looked like he had cut himself somehow. So we started to understand that he liked to party a lot more than we had perhaps heard about. Um, and I'm taking my first vacation, and this is before the iPhone. I'm down in the Caribbean with my girlfriend, now wife, and I get, I'm walking to the lobby, and they have those old pink sheets. I don't know if you, anyone here is old enough to remember, like, here you have a phone message, and there's like five of them. <laughs> Mike, you need to call David Kennedy. This is my business partner. Mike, you really need to call David. <laughs> you know, like, all day long he had been calling. So I finally call him up. The punchline of the story was, it turns out the guy we hired was, had developed a major cocaine problem that we had not, he hadn't had that in his previous employment, but he was a raging coke addict and had missed meetings upon meetings and David was basically calling me saying, we, I need to fire him right now, are you okay with that? So that was my first holy blank moment as a searcher where you go, I really don't know what I'm doing and I thought I did everything right, so that was the first story in the battle scar. So now I'm just curious, is the generalizable lesson from this, <laughs> I'm seeing people taking there notes. There is no and lesson for this. You. <clears throat> don't, so don't, don't hire coke hire addicts. Coke we, addicts. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I mean, you guys wanted, you wanted something you could take away from this session? Don't hire coke addicts. There you go. Now I want to try and dig a little deeper here because my sense yep. is that it, it does dovetail with what we heard before about the challenges associated with hiring. Um, is, are there special challenges associated with, uh, you know, sort of interviewing and hiring people in sales? Yes, you know? absolutely. And if so, I mean, I, I think that we all want to avoid the raging drug addict. Yeah, problem. that's pretty good. But the fact of the matter separate. is, I think that there are some special and generalizable issues when it comes to scaling the sales force. You're trying to identify the right person with the right set of attributes. Yeah. How can we do that with sales? I mean, what's your experience? Y yeah, and, and I would, I mean, the, the quick vignette too is I ended up firing two more salespeople. So we went through, the business was growing. I did, I, I messed this up, is my point. I, I messed up hiring a head of sales multiple times. The, the hardest part of hiring a head of sales is they're really good at selling. And it sounds so simplistic, but they are naturally trained to present themselves in the best format. And they are really good at handling objections. And they're really good at talking you through how they're going to do things. And so what we ended up developing over time, uh, and it's a longer story how we got there, but we developed a McKinsey-like case approach to really flush out the natural aura of a sales profession. I think that's the number one challenge, especially if, like most searchers, you didn't come up in the sales organization, so you haven't been a salesperson before. You meet these candidates and you think, wow, she's awesome. Mm -hmm. All the great answers, all that stuff, that's what, they're, that's what they've been trained, trained to do their whole career. Right. So if you, based on your experience now, you know, I have essentially taught with a number of people who are also sales practitioners who have been, you know, thinking about these issues. What's interesting is, is that none of them that I've ever met would characterize themselves as, um, you know, they have a high hit rate. I mean, it's not like you say, oh, you know, 99% of the time, I can tell. Yeah. It's more like 60 to 70%. With sales professionals, no matter how hard we work at interviewing, coming up with case studies and so on, it's like 60 to 70% of the time. Yeah. First of all, is that consistent with your experience? And then second of all, how do you deal with that, uh, that kind of success rate? Yeah, I mean, my personal estimate, what I've seen personally and with portfolio companies, I think that's high. <laughs> Not high in the way you alluded to at the start of the <laughs> session. Right. Um, but uh, I, I, I think, it's, I think the, the loss ratio or the miss ratio is probably even greater than that, maybe okay. 50%. But I think one of the things that I advocate and I learned, and I'm happy to tell you how we got there, is that you can't, when I gave the plumber example, there's often a misnomer that says, I just need to go find a salesperson. And what I really um, emphasize is that you need to go research and figure out a lot about the sales process. 
So what is your buyer mindset? What, what is the objections that need to be overcome? Because those things will then lead you to different type of salespeople. Mm -hmm. I mean, naturally everyone knows, hey, am I, getting an S am, I, am I selling to consumer or am I selling to enterprise? Am I selling SMB or am I selling complex um, enterprise solutions? That's a pretty easy bifurcation on the sales team. The next, the second or tertiary level down is to start to say, okay, but what type of personality is going to work? And, and what skills do they really need to have? And I think if you do that work, really going to first principles, if you will, mm -hmm. that will drive a much different hiring process than most people start off with, most leaders like I did start off with. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I wanted to say, uh, how many of you are aware of the fact that Mike Smirklow has a blog? You ever been there, ever seen it? Okay, so he has a pretty interesting four-part blog entry on yep. sales and sort of finding the right person for sales and so on. Yeah, it's and called, uh, and it's, already, it's, it's called sales leaders are like cats. And it basically came from a speech, I, like someone said to me, it's like, I, sales people are like cats, I just don't understand them. Yeah. And so I take that analogy and run it probably to death. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's elongated expose on this exact uh, experience. Yeah. And I think that what uh, the, uh, it's kind of interesting about the four part bit is that Mike teases you through the, first four, th through the first three blog entries to get to the fourth one, where he talks a little bit about the formula for success. And I thought it was interesting because you mentioned some things about mapping the sales process onto the attributes of the individuals mm -hmm. that you're looking for, which I think is actually what's necessary to get you to that 50 to 60 percent success rate in hiring. And not a lot of people give it the thought that it deserves, but there's a certain task that you need to have accomplished, and in order to accomplish that task, you need to be able to figure out who are the right people, what are the attributes that you're looking for. That'll get you to that point where you're now screening out the obvious mistakes, yep. but it's still very difficult to get to the point where you're going to be 100% correct. It should not be something you aspire to because the best sales professionals that I have met in the you know, classes I've taught and everything else, they just accept that they can't do that. Well, the other thing I would, and I, I agree with everything you said, Jim, and I think the other thing that I, I did by, so literally we fired three head of sales, so Egan can remember, and the business was growing 100% a year, so we're literally growing year over year 100% and we're firing head of sales, so something wasn't right. And I talked about this blog, but <clears throat> I was immensely frustrated because after the cocaine guy, then we tried to get salesy guy, that didn't work, and then we went and got a BPO guy, and it just, it just didn't, seem, it didn't seem to fit. And so Mark Leslie, who had been a, a great mentor of mine, I went and explained this to him, and he said, you don't, it seems like you don't know what you're hiring for, um, so why don't you hire a couple of different heads of sales and try it out? And so I went to the board and said, I'm going to run sales. Um, David, had, uh, David Kennedy had gone off to start his, his private equity firm. So the business was at this point, I don't know how many people, six, 700 people or something like that, and I said, I'm going to run sales for a year and I'm going to hire four VPs of sales, and I'm going to purposely hire different attributes. And you talk about A-B testing at scale, if you know what A-B testing is. This is like really, I don't know what the, the closed executive session was with the board after I left. Like, maybe we need a new CEO, I'm sure it was one of the multiple <laughs> times it was brought up. But um, I said, I'm going to try this, and we ended up hiring four different salespeople. And of the four, um, the la number four, the guy that we actually didn't really think was a good fit, ended up being remarkable. And I would have never hired him had I not done this model. So, um, you know, better to be lucky than good or whatever the example is. But, you know, of the four, three of the four ended up taking different jobs in the company. One guy went to run our inside sales team, one became a GM, one we fired, and one went on to be our head of sales and did an incredible job for us for multiple years. Took us all the way through uh, our IPO. So it, but it was only through that testing that we finally said, okay, now we got the guy. And then once we got the leader, we were able to map back the attributes and then build a case study that said, okay, we know what the attributes are. We know what we're looking for. Let's build a case study and let's turn our recruiters on. And that was really where we hit you know, kind of the, the magical scale part of, of yeah. the organization. And so, I mean, I just think it's interesting because it shows up in the class that we teach again and again, this idea that first of all, you got to have a model that tells yeah. you something about the process or the task you want completed and the attributes that you're looking for. Yeah. But ultimately, it also means that you got to experiment with people. 
right? You've got to bring people on board to the organization and then find out whether or not they're up to the task. And that's where you take that 60% and so on, and you begin to weed out the, the mistakes that you make through there. Yeah, certainly, especially when you're in a, and I think this is also a, one of the attributes is depending on how mature the market is, are there known successful sales? Is there an organization in the marketplace that has a great sales executive and they're selling the same value proposition? Probably a little bit easier to poach, but if you're in a newer market or less established value proposition, experimentation, I don't, I don't know how else you do it. Yeah. So let's stop our conversation here and invite some participation from the group. So we've talked a little bit about this idea, you know, I guess in the, in the morning they talked about these steps to scaling and that first step of scaling begins with people, although we've interjected this notion that some reflection on process is important in order for you to refine your understanding of the person that you need. Yep. But from a sales perspective, we've sort of shared a few things here. What questions does that bring to mind for you at the stage that you are in the, your search process? And let's you know, sort of open it up and take a few questions. I'll start over here and we'll work our way uh, around. Okay, so now uh, a bit of process in all of this. Because this is being taped, and we're Mike, that could pick us up, but you guys, your questions will not be as easily heard. So if it sounds like I'm repeating you guys, it's because I am. That's just for the benefit of the tape for later. So the question, and I'll summarize it a little bit, is uh, what do you do in sort of providing the growth path opportunity for those who join as sales but want to move into sales management roles? How would you think about that? So. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly hard challenge and I think probably harder than most functions. Someone in the previous panel talked about, you know, you as a CEO and then your leaders in the growth organization's job is constantly changing. I think sales is particularly hard uh, because of the very attributes and how different the job is. Sales leader versus individual contributor isn't just about expanded scope. It's a remarkably different, in my humble opinion, um, expertise needed. So what I would do, and I had that multiple times, is I would really tend to sit down with the sales person who's looking for that career growth and explain to them what I think sales leadership's about and then talk to them about, do you really want to sit in the staff meeting and here get the update from HR? Do you really want to spend your bulk of your time in Salesforce getting the pipeline, managing other folks? And I think there is a, there's always good salespeople always want to, like any other, want to progress forward. I think it's pretty black and white in terms of those who can actually move into that role. So I guess my, my short advice is sit down and make sure they fully understand what leadership looks like because I found 9 out of 10 uh, sales individual contributors, when they started to think about the job, they thought, I really don't want to do that. You know, I, I like to go out and, you know, the really good salespeople in my humble experience, um, they like to win and they like to put points on the board or whatever analogy you want to use and that's very different than what the sales leadership job is. So I've learned a lot from teaching with Kirk Bowman, who's right now running the parallel session over here. And uh, one of the things that Kirk says is that you promote people based on their understanding of the business. And that is not the same as making your number. And there are people who are very good at making a number, but the fact is that the people who can forecast well, who know something about managing a pipeline, an account, and a customer, who are inclined to work with other people to help them succeed, those are the things that you use. And if you did you know, one of these uh, attribute profile differences, what you yep. find is that you're looking for a very different set of people. Then the question is, if you have the growth potential to want to keep those managerial potential people you know, in your organization, you need to create the opportunity for them to move into a sales management role. We have a great example. One of the case studies that we wrote for the class is on Qualtrics. Qualtrics took an inside sales organization and basically grew that inside sales organization and now have a path for those people who want to move on to the larger, more enterprise-oriented sales. They can step into there, step into sales management roles. But it was a really interesting process of architecture, creating the organization that allowed people to see the ladder 
through which you would move and the qualities that you needed as an individual to succeed there. Okay, now I know we had a, something in the middle over here. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, sales specialization? You know, a lot of people are having an all-in-one sales person with prospects and closing and then customer success versus a lot of, it seems lately, people moving more towards specialization. And what impact in terms of managing that and compensation has come along with those changes? Okay, so the question is about Salesforce specialization, do we ask one person to complete all the tasks associated with a sales role, or do we use a hybrid type of a model in which different people do different tasks? Yeah, I, mean, I think the, the, it's a great question. I think the harder part of the question is scale and size of company. Um, I think for most, and so I'm going to steer my advice or insights mostly towards search small to medium-sized businesses. I personally believe that Early on, you have to have someone who can do it all, and maybe not customer success. That's a that's a different uh, animal altogether. But in terms of being able to prospect, the most frustrating thing I see is folks who say, you know, if a salesperson comes in and says, "I need a BDI, I need a, a development component, I need marketing component, I need cold calling," that's 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 a that's what Oracle does when you're you know thirty billion dollars in sales. But if you're five to ten million or ten to twenty, whatever it is, I fundamentally believe that you have to do the bulk of the activities in one job at this stage. But others may have a different point of view. I just think that's, and I think it's a really good indicator. If you have a sales leader who starts talking about all that stuff, I'm on a board, a couple million dollar SaaS company, and the sales leader started talking about that stuff, and he's like, I don't think this is the right sales leader. So I um, will add that I don't think, um, you know, that, I think it depends upon the economics of your value proposition. And I think that, you know, a lot of times people are looking for a go-to-market solution which is significantly less expensive. So the top-to-bottom sales individual who handles it all, that can be a very expensive model sometimes. Yeah. So companies that have figured out how to do demo uh, on the web, right? How to let people get this information and so on. I think that more and more companies will be searching for hybrid solutions that involve technology that take some of the tasks away from the sales force. What you need the sales force to do is it's often the persuasion, the closing, the dealing with the complex sale. Um, and what we're finding is that you know, there's a wide range of different sorts of solutions. And then managing that hybrid structure tends to be a bit more challenging but it's necessary for some companies just because of the economics. Yeah, and I'd say, I mean, I think as a CEO, one of your, I think the hardest jobs, especially when you're getting the job, is learning to qualify a pipeline. And so I think when you, when you talk about these things, there's a lot of technology, but I think the hardest part is just figuring out the no BS, what's the number gonna be. Yeah. And so I think if you can isolate, the tools are great, but when I think about an emerging growth business, you know, how many times have you had I mean, everyone who's in here who's running a company, you've missed a quarter. I've certainly missed a bunch. And usually it's because the salesperson was overly optimistic. And so I think trying to get, when I say, that's why I'm more on the model of, you've got to really understand, do they know what they're doing? Can they sell? And they, can they actually predict what they're going to close? Three different skill sets. Yeah. All right, come over to this section over here. Brad. Yeah, uh, so the question was around the washout rate and is there a better way to do it. Um, to be clear, I, I actually think the 50% is more around for a head of sales. I think if you're washing out 50% of your reps, you do have a, you have a different problem. Um, you have, I think you have a recruiting problem at that point. You're not, you're not recruiting. Uh, on reps, I mean, I think you're, at scale, I think you should be able to get to 70% would be maybe that's too high. But whenever I'm helping with sales forecasting, I'm, okay, you got 10 reps, 70% are going to make quota. 
is usually what I would hope to be at a best practice, and 30% aren't going to make it, and it doesn't mean you wash them out. But I think your other question is a really good one. Uh, so service source was, we started with one outside salesperson. We ended up, when I, when I moved to chairman, with about 50 or 60 people in the outside sales function. We also had an inside sales team that went from 30 to almost 3,000 by the time, over the time I, I ran the business. Um, it, so there are two different beasts, I guess, in my first point. And then secondly, we trained the heck out of both. And I don't think on our inside sales team, we had nowhere, we probably had an 85 or 90% success rate. So it's a different model, but I'm, I'm a big believer that, yes, you should train, yes, you should do acclimation, and yes, you should do um, repeated case-based testing for reps development, either inside or outside. Meaning like, if you come in and you want to learn how to sell, I don't think throwing you to the wolves and saying, here's a list of customers to go call really works. It might work in some industries, but I think if you're anywhere you're in complex sale, I just don't think that model works. So cases are not just for hiring, they're also for... I think you can use them through to test. And we were in a really different case. I don't want to want to overextend it, uh, the, the analogy. But we would take a rep, and we would count on a six-month maturation process, six months, before we expected them to even start to get meaningful outside sales, outside meetings. And then we had a one year, are they going to make it or not? But, you, but, that's, but you got to layer in training. And when I say case-based, you're sitting on calls with them. You're doing some role playing with them in, as you're training them. And then you're starting to let them make calls. And you hope that they're building a pipeline by six months. And in our case, we were hoping that they would, or expecting them to start to close meaningful business after a year. So I'd like to make a distinction between um, that personal productivity ramp of the individual salesperson and the sales learning curve of the entire organization. And the challenge that a lot of you guys will face because you are at an early stage of the process is that you're still trying to nail down that sales model. You're still trying to understand what it takes to create a repeatable sales process. Yep. And a lot of times, if you've got this high washout rate, this turnover rate, it's not because the individual salespeople aren't good. It's because they've been given a task which is insufficiently well-defined yeah. in terms of this is the model that we believe is repeatable. And in Mike's blog, he talks about the fact is you got to understand the basis on which you are succeeding. Yeah. And then you're going to build an organization to scale that opportunity. So the big lesson here is don't start to scale until you, have, you are confident that you have a repeatable sales model in place. If you can do that, then I think you still need to give people the opportunity to succeed. That's the how long will it take a, you know, a, a capable individual to learn this model and then be able to uh, reach productivity in the organization. Jim says things so much better than I do. I make. Can I just like? Can I put my chicken scratch down and hand it to you? And you so, so but, eloquent. you know, this this is a message I think, and I, you know, I have to give credit to Mark Leslie for those of you who have ever heard him speak on the learning curve. It is something that is an epiphany for a lot of people. Oh my God! The reason that we're washing people out is because we haven't learned sufficiently about what it takes for a rep to have a repeatable process and for them to be successful. Yeah. It is great, a great, his, his, I mean, I, I reference it in my blog. I learned yeah. a lot from it. And yeah. I think what, I want, what I'm trying to emphasize is the risk when you're a first-time CEO or new CEO is that you kind of go, I sit in my office, I look at the numbers, he or she missed their numbers again, I, I need a new head of sales. And that is a, and I did it, I made that mistake three times. The repeatable process, but then also, Get out of your office, go on a bunch of calls, learn what the heck's working, what's not working, and then come back and head a higher, higher head of sales versus, I think it's just a very common mistake to say, I don't know anything about sales. Sales is hard. I've never done sales. Just go out, go on yeah. some prospecting calls. Yeah, yeah. You'll learn a ton. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great, I mean, it's a great lesson, a great message that comes through in your blog post and so on for somebody who has the battle scars of having hired and failed and hired and failed. I think there are, um, lessons to be learned and you can kind of pass that on to this group here and you'll make your own mistakes and so on but maybe that's one that you don't have to thanks to Mike Smirklow. Or maybe, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, you know the thing I learned is I actually was pretty good at it and so I kept trying to outsource this and it was like, my board was like, you're pretty good at it, maybe you should allocate it to spend more time on selling and that may be another answer. Maybe you don't need a head of sales. Yeah. Maybe you as the entrepreneur, that's what you're really good at 
and then you can hire around you for, to, to cover other parts of the operation. Okay, let's come back to this side of the room and see if we have questions. In the back. That's a, yep. Can you talk about the kind of criteria for the other one where sitting at board meetings and kind of having a great look at the audience, but then you also made the decision to part ways with the, with the person who was responsible for the audience? Yeah, so, so the question is, is that what were the criteria around not, um, of having in, unsuccessful hires, I guess, I don't know the head of sales. I'd say the, the mistakes I made were a little bit of the, um, the delegation aspect that I alluded to before, where we were growth, and it felt good, but I thought, I really don't know what I'm doing with sales. So, so the second guy that we fired um, came in with all of the, I know how to do this, and he really didn't. He was completely full of, um, uh, of uh, nonsense, uh, BS, I guess you'd say. <laughs> um, but he, and then the third guy was a prototypical, like, I know how to hire sales, and talked all about processes and people and all these things that sounded, again, sounded right. And they were right, they just weren't right for our marketplace. So he, I, I, I'm sure, has been very successful in other businesses, but what he just didn't resonate with our customers. And so what I would net it out is, even though the business was growing quite successfully, we hadn't figured out, and I think Jim says it West, we hadn't figured out what we were looking for to repeatably hire great sales professionals. And if you look at a head of sales, your job is to hire, train, manage, hit numbers. And we didn't really know what type of rep we were looking for. So we were giving these heads of sales, hey, here's, you got bud, budget to go hire 10 people. But the third guy, didn't, he went and hired 10 people, and they were all kind of like him. And they didn't work in our marketplace. They didn't resonate with our customers. So that's when we had to wipe it out. But my real learning is, is just for the head of sales to think about what, is the, what does the individual contributor look like? How can you build processes to replicate that as fast as possible? And that really starts with, again, knowing your audience, yeah. knowing your customer base. And it is, it's an expensive mistake to make because when you turn over the head of sales, you turn over about 50% of your sales organization. And when you turn over 50% of the sales organization, now you've got 50% of people who are starting at the bottom of that personal productivity curve again. Yeah. And so, you know, I've looked at case studies in which as companies go through the turmoil of trying to find the person, you watch the sales organization go like this. It's like, I'm back to zero again. I'm back to zero yeah. again. And so... Um, it leads I, to the old three envelopes joke, which I won't tell, but it's, you know, if anyone's heard that joke, it's... Mm -hmm. Anyone heard the three envelope joke? Yeah. Now you got to tell us. Now you have to tell us. <laughs> tell us, Joe? Can I tell us? Yeah, right. well... New CEO walks... I'll do it quickly. New CEO walks into the desk and is... is so the former CEO says, um, hey, you know what, I put three envelopes in your drawer, and uh, every time you have a really bad board meeting and things aren't going well, go to the drawer and open the envelope. Okay, so first bad, misses his quarter, goes, open, opens the envelope, it says, um, restructure the organization. The guy announces a big restructuring organization. A couple months later, a couple months, quarters later, misses the second quarter, goes, pulls out the second envelope, hire the head of sales, fire the head of sales does that, misses a couple more quarters, goes to open up the third envelope, and the third envelope says, take out a pen and get three envelopes. I <laughs> think <laughs> <laughs> Billy can taught me that one, I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, when you fire a head, when you fire a head of sales, is the, the, the moral of the story, is when you fire a head of sales, not only do you lose all the reps, but you put the organization probably a year back. Because then you've got to start everything over. So it is, yeah. yeah. Question? So the question is, you have somebody who runs counter to everything that your company stands for in terms of culture, but hits his number. Right. Is the only guy who's hit his number, 
do you get rid of him or not? Absolutely. And we, we did it. We did it. We had a guy that Let's was, have audience participation oh, sure. for a yep. second. How many of you in hearing this and sort of thinking about your role would say, yeah, the guy's got to go? Raise your hand if you think the guy's got to go. How many think, yeah, how many think, no, I would not get rid of this guy because he runs counter. And how many of you are not sure? Yeah, okay, so there'd be a few people who are not sure. But you yeah, yeah, my, had no doubt. My doubt, um, it was, to me, it was a cultural issue. We, we had a very good example, exact thing. We had an individual contributor, as we're struggling through this, one guy who was making his numbers and driving a big part of our business and did some things that were, um, they weren't, it wasn't the Coke guy, that was an easy one, but it was just, he wasn't a cultural fit and was doing a lot of things that were disruptive and we made a difficult choice to fire him. And a lot of my leaders to this day that work for me would still say that was a seminal moment in the company. Because what it showed was that we, as a leadership team, were not, we were, we were set upon building a great culture. And I think that's, you know, I, I can't answer in your particular situation, but I think as a leader you will have these moments where you'll say, what's acceptable? And it doesn't matter if it's, if you make an exception, then you'll make another exception, I guess is the way to put it. So in the morning session, I thought Chris made a really good point. He said, what I try to do is I try to envision where I want to be, and I work backwards yep. from there. So now the question is, where do you want your organization to go? And my sense is that the path to there doesn't lead through this individual. He's keeping you from... I mean, unless your vision for the future involves this guy, then I think that he's holding you back. He's, you know, he's undermining the culture, which I think the point was made really effectively this morning, that that is the most important thing in terms of your being able to get people on board to join your mission to help you accomplish that vision. So if he's in the way of that, yes, it's really hard in the short term, but I think that's what you have to do. How about here in the back? Yeah. In that, sorry, I don't have your name, but Mario. In, your, Mario, in your case, you may be a really big contributor, and you might have debt obligations, and there's a few of the other considerations that would come into play. Yeah, so the question is where we were in when we made that decision. It was early. It was not at scale. Okay. Um, it was a big decision, let's put it that way. In, in, in a board level, like, this is the one guy. <laughs> and I remember, it's like, this, you're going to fire him, the number one rep. Um, so we were probably number one out of seven or eight reps that we had. So it was a big decision. Um, also, but it does, oddly enough, it, it gives you a chance to go then fill the gap yourself. You know, what if a guy's cutting corners, you know, ethically and so on, there are little issues and so on, but you got debt obligations. You got a whole bunch of people that you're, you know, are counting on you for the company to continue so they can continue to be employed and so on. I appreciate you helping us to put this closer to the knife edge in yeah. terms of an ethical dilemma. However, there's no sales leader that I've ever talked to in the context of my class who wouldn't say, as soon as you make a compromise that undermines the trust in the organization, you are dead. You are dead. I mean, you've lost all of those things that you're trying to build there. So those are all really hard things to address, but I would encourage you to think about how am I going to address them after we get rid of this guy who's poisoning the culture of the organization. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Uh, now this side over here, yeah. So the question about a set of services kind of ahead of scale and you mentioned accountability is pretty big. So certainly as you're trying to scale the business, you want to I I find that the person you can get makes a difference. Someone who brings a lot of accountability to the business. But at the same time, fighting as a team, having emails, having your reps like at some level the head of sales is also So just to repeat, you know, the question for the camera, um, we're talking about uh, two different styles of sales leadership, one of which is a little bit more friendly and team building and so on, but less in terms of accountability and performance. The other, very high discipline, high accountability, but people just aren't as happy in those 
working in that context? What do you do then? Yeah, it's a really tough question. I mean, you know, it's like 1A, 1B. I guess if I had to, because that's the only way I can force myself to answer the question. You know, it's like the interview question I always ask is, are, are, you here, are you a great leader because you work hard or you're smart? Right? There's no right answer, but you kind of want to get a flavor of it. I, I would have to go with accountability in 1A. I just think if you don't, if you have an organization and you don't want a jerk, and if the guy, if the guy or gal is not a great leader, that's a different conversation. But I think in that particular discipline, like most of us, if you don't have accountability, it's hard to build. You know, it's it's building a house on a on sand, if you will, because you're you're always going to be in a situation where you don't really know. Certainly, as a CEO, if the numbers are going to work, and that that to me is the hardest part about it. So I would say, if you had to go one A, one B, I'd go accountability. And we had CEOs this morning talk about the importance of their role in developing their team. And I don't think there's any, you know, necessarily any executive relationship that isn't any closer than head of sales and CEO in the organization. And so I do think that one of the reflections you'd say is, so, you know, which <coughs> thing could be coached? I mean, if yeah. I had A without B or B without A, then the question is, which could I influence as somebody who is a partner to this organization? And I do think that you play that role as coach. And I don't think you want to tell sales how to do their job. But I do think you want to say, we're in this together to create a high-performance organization. I'm concerned that we have people leaving. What are your thoughts on this? How are we going to move in that direction? So I know that Peter Kelly seemed to give the impression that, you know, you guys there's so much promise in what you're doing that great people will beat a path to your door. As a marketer, I tend to never believe that. I never believe that the better mousetrap is going to lead those people to me. So the question is, the people who you find who have potential and promise, which are the ones that are coachable in the right direction? And I wonder whether or not it might be easier to coach the guy who can establish accountability into one where you say, I want people to feel like they are valued within this organization and not tortured within it. Um, that might, I, I don't know for sure, but I would say you probably have the information to help you make that decision. All right, I'll swing back over to this side over here, yeah. Okay, so the question is, what would a playbook look like for scaling the sales organization for a new business from day one to year five? Yeah, I think, well, there's a lot of great folks here that have done the entrepreneurial research to, to add to this, so maybe we can make that audience participation. I would, my quick answer is, I would do two things. I would go see as many customers and prospects as I could to, to make my own assessment, which sounds obvious, but often in, when you're... You know, we all know when I bought a business, you suddenly, you know, you go from sitting in an office calling, cold calling companies to now you're running a company. And if it's your first time, um, like it was for me, you really don't know what you're doing. So I, my advice is to go out to see as many prospects and customers. And then secondarily, I would try and find, to the example here we had earlier, if you have one good individual contributor who's actually hitting the numbers, and when we bought Service Source, I was incredibly lucky on multiple levels, but we had one of the founders who was really good, and I just followed him around. And so I would say, like, as a playbook, I'm not sure I have an elongated answer, but if you, one, go out and see the customers and prospects, but two, if you got one guy or gal who's really good, just hover around them for probably, I did it for a year. And from there, you'll learn a tremendous amount. And I think that's, you know, of all the things you have to do when you first buy a business, it may be, you could argue, the most valuable thing to do. So I don't know if that, I mean, your, your question was more extended than that, and I don't know if there's others in the audience that have a perspective on it, but that would be my 30 to 60 day approach, I guess. I thought that was five years. I mean, I assume that would change over the course of five years. Yeah, I mean, th then you're getting into, I mean, the complexity of the question becomes at five years, um, I would just caveat and say, okay, what scale are you talking about? Are you, you know, are you 30 salespeople? Are you international? There's a bunch of a aspects that probably waste a lot of time going on, but I think yeah, I, I guess I would say it depends. I don't know. 
So it's, it's, it's hard to think about. I mean, I, I, I'm not aware of anybody who has written this playbook, right? So I would say that what I would tell the CEO to expect between day one and year five is that you're probably not going to do it with the same individual. So this is a learning curve function, but the fact of the matter is, is that on day one, you're trying to do what, what Mike suggested is, I'm looking for the repeatable, scales mo sca the re repeatable sales model, and I haven't learned it yet. And so I'm going to deploy resources, and I'm going to give people incentive to discover what it takes to succeed in finding our target customers and selling, right? When I get to that point, and I start to have some success, you sort of think of that as traction. It is unlikely that the person you have who's running around and talking to customers and everything else is going to be the one who will then put a factory in place to allow you to replicate this sales model over and over again. And sometimes people grow into that role, but sometimes they don't. And so the art for the CEO is to help people to understand what role they're going to play and they're going to be comfortable in at each stage of this process and maybe helping people to understand when they're going to step out, when they're going to help you find the next person and so on. But I can't tell you how many cases that we've looked at in sales organizations where the guy who started things out is not the guy who helped bring that, that organization to scale. The mistake you'd make is you say, we got to be at scale in five years. I don't know. Could be one year could be 10 years, you know? It's gonna take you a while to sort of figure that out. So the other thing I would say is, don't get hamstrung to the playbook. You start here and say, the first thing we have to do is figure out what our repeatable scales, scale, sales model is. When we've got that, come back to me and talk about some of the next steps. I think it's pretty good. I mean, I, one of the things I learned and I didn't do right is that, I think that's a good advice for all leadership positions. Even, and sales is probably the best example, but there are, you know, NBA teams go out and hire a power forward for one year and it worked to try and win the championship or whatever your sports example. And I think as a leader, you sometimes can get caught up on this. And there are just great people that work for you for 12 to 18 months, and they did a great job, but your needs change. And so I think, you know, I'm not, I don't want to build a culture where you're firing people all the time, but there is just a situational aspect that says in every function, sometimes if you get a couple of years a great, out of a great individual contributor or leader, that's a wonderful thing. It's not a bad thing. It happens all the time. How about here? So we have inside sales in the headquarters office. We have outside sales. And then mm. Have you ever tried it or had it work or had it not work to have a head of sales that wasn't in the headquarters office? I, so the question is, is having the head of sales at, and I'm assuming earlier stage or emerging growth? Uh, so around 10 sales people today. Yeah, 10 sales people today. Do you have the head of sales in headquarters? Um, I would say preferably yes. Even in remote employees, I, I did have a head of sales that wasn't at near the end, that wasn't in the office, and I just, it never really worked. Um, so I would make a strong, early on we made all of the executives be here, or the company was here in San Francisco, we made them all work and live there. And we would disqualify folks if it wasn't appropriate for them. And maybe at scale it's different, but I would think where you are now, there's so much stuff happening. There's so much learning that's happening. There's just there's things happening that's hard to imagine that important of a position isn't sitting you know next year pretty close to you. My point of view. Okay, in the middle. Yeah. Uh, one of the inherent problems that I've found with salespeople is a short attention span. Right? ADD. I have it. You know, we've kind of all over the place. And so uh, one of the things you mentioned before in discussing that is taking the time to properly train the people. You mentioned the six month sales process you're committed and you have real results. Yeah, so, so the question about sales training, um, I think it's incredibly important. And, you know, some tactics that we did, this is, again, some of the stuff pre-iPhone days, but we would even, because it was so important, we had a small group of target customers, so we didn't want to have a, a bad prospecting experience. But we would make them um, leave voicemails to uh, um, explain our value proposition in a short voicemail message internally. We would make them present to the leadership team before they were able to go out and call. Because every salesperson says, 
I'm good at this, I know what I'm doing, give me the deck in my list, and I'm gonna go, at least when my experience was. So we were very, very protective of our customer base, and so we did do, make them do training sessions ongoing. Uh, and then the other thing we did at more of its scale was we would start to bring them to customer quarterly business reviews just so they could understand what they were selling. And we were in a BPO, business process outsourcing play. Um, but really keep them engaged. And then last but not least, um, overly over communicated. So I can go on, there's a lot of things you do. But one, I think it's critically important. There's some very specific tactics you can do. And I think the hardest part, three, I would say, is resist the urge that the salesperson is going to have to say, hey, I, I got this. I know what I'm doing. Don't underestimate how much you can change the inflection of the curve through good training. Now, sales management process in which you inspect progress towards quota on a regular basis. There's an expectation that we have a phone call every week, you have a sales meeting, and so on. And so good sales management will be able to zero in on what if there's attention deficit problems, what is not being paid attention to? And one of the things you get into sales organizations is they get into this cadence where everybody's trying to close deals at the end of the quarter and then they're desperately you know, trying to fill their pipeline at the beginning of the quarter and so on. Good sales management, I think, will help them to make sure that you pay attention to the right things, you sort of smooth that out. And I, you know, I, I think that a good expectation of here's the business, here's how we do this, that's the, you know, the role of the sales manager to make sure that the sales organization is following along those lines. One thing I'd add real quick, too, is us, I also differentiate. I'll make sure I almost forgot this point. There's sales pipeline, you know, what Salesforce monitors each stage. We differentiate that between the buying process, which sounds weird, but we actually spend a lot of time on who's the buyer, who's the sniper, who's going to try and kill us without us knowing it what were the, the emotional steps a buyer had to go through, and we would actually track that with the pipeline. They're very different. You know, did demo, demo, want to go to contract. That's the stuff you track in Salesforce. We spent a lot of time on the buyer's journey, if you will, and then use that to monitor both how our deals were progressing, but also what reps were, what, where they might be missing steps, and that was being the really fundamental training for us. And I think it's often overlooked as well. Yeah. And, and the decision makers and influencers within customer base and then that sets the sales profile for the sales individuals. Absolutely. It's wonderful. You should talk more about it. I mean, it's a great thing. And I don't think, and because and especially in, if it's a com, sounds like complex enterprise sale, we actually named the buyer, like Mary. And it's coming now, but like here's what Mary does and, and got into the psychological profile, as you said. And then it can really change how you can walk into a meeting. And also change you as the CEO helps you understand in a meeting, like I would go to meetings and be able to walk out and go, they're not buying. Because I saw Sam over there, who's VP of IT, I saw his or her body language and I know they're not gonna buy. Like it just helps you monitor the sales process. Really great advice. Okay, Andy. over here, yeah. You talked earlier about the, the challenge involved with having the best salesperson have a desire to send this into a sales leader type role. Um, and you talked in our I know it's a different skill set, but how does the ability to be an apprentice, a mentor in the apprenticeship relationship, influence your choice around the best salesperson? All right, so the question has to do with um, the role of the, um, you know, sort of mentor and manager in the inside sales process. Uh, I don't know, I, I mean, that's a... A tough question. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, we, we found that we would actually, we would promote similarly. So on inside sales, we would move to someone to play or coach, and they would actually still hold the quota. So the big part for me, what I'm not sure I understood the question, but for us, we wanted to make sure it was the natural progression. When you're an individual contributor, then we move them to what we call the team lead, but the team lead still had a quota. So you can start to see, are they going to make the jump to real leadership? 
Um, and then we also, we moved a lot of people out of inside sales and made them train the trainers. So there's some people that are just, they kind of get the job, but they don't love it. And so we would naturally be looking for what we call train the trainers, someone that could go train other inside sales professionals. So I guess what I'm getting at too is you can find different tracks for that, for that person, but I'm not sure if I'm exactly answering your question. I think, I think you answered it by saying most people can create a team leader and, and test. Test. But keep them on a quota. Keep them on a quota. Do not take away the quota, at least in our mind, because then, then you could see motivation, managerial, you know, a bunch of natural skills that you need to move on to a managerial level. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, so a question has to do with hunters versus farmers. How do you, you know, think about those two different profiles? Uh, <laughs> I guess um, pretty simply, I think farmers don't have quota, and they are um, really good folks to help with uh, customer engagement. I think hunters have quota. I mean, I don't want to oversimplify it, but I, I hear this a lot, and I don't really know too many successful farmers in the sales organization. I have a little bit different point of view, but if you're a farmer, that implies something very different than going out and getting net new. And maybe it's install base or not, but I, I always found that there's the farmer mindset to me is you're not carrying quota. But perhaps that's oversimplifying. But I think it becomes challenging when you start to think about what's the role that somebody is going to play. So as we moved from enterprise software to software as a service, the idea of selling that $2 million installation and then, you know, essentially you get to eat what you kill. Yeah. Right. Versus selling something, you know, for a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars a month over time, as you begin to compensate people in different ways. Well, okay, so you have an annuity now, which will pay out to you as long as we have this particular customer. What it does is the question of sales specialization. It begins to blunt the your ability to provide incentive for somebody who's really going out to look for new business. And often I think that's the difference here is that the hunter is going to bring in net new. And then they're good at that. You want to compensate them extremely well for it and give them the opportunity to move on to continue to do that. So that would then involve creating a hybrid sales organization in which you have a way of passing on the yeah. customer growth, acquisition, you know, engagement and retention yeah. and so on. I just would, I, I, I'm simple. I, I would say you're either shooting an elephant in the old enterprise software model, and now you're just shooting a bunch of squirrels. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're still shooting. You're still a hunter. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the cultivation aspect is a very important aspect of it. I just don't think that's a sales function. So. Right. Okay. Well, here we are. We're at 12.15, right? We are out of time. Please join me in thanking Mike for taking his time to come. <laughs>